So here we go. Um, lust, there's a quote by this guy, Friedrich Beekner that I, I like a lot, you know, and he, he writes stuff that makes sense to me. And um, he says that lust is the craving for salt of a man who is dying of thirst, you know, and I don't know if you spend any time on boats out in the ocean, you know, one of the things you're going to learn when you get a, a boat license and you're going to go out in the Gulf or out in the ocean is you're going to learn what to do if you capsize, right? And um, one of the things they're going to tell you about is what not to do. And they're going to say, whatever you don't do, when you get really, really thirsty, do not drink the water. You're going to go, well, why not? It's like, because it's salt water. What does salt water do? Dries it, dries you out inside. And when it dries you out, you want more water. So the more you drink of it, the more thirsty you get, the more you want it, the more dry you get, the more you want it, the more dry you get, the more you want it. That sounds a lot like life as we know it, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like what life is like when you get on that treadmill and you can't, you can't figure out how to get off of it. And you might even, you know, it's not that you want to drink more salt water. It's just, well, I mean, it's just that you got to. That, that's the way it feels, doesn't it? You just, you just kind of, you kind of got to. And this conversation about lust, we're going to open it wide tonight. You know, it's going to have a lot, it's going to have more, to, it's going to have to do with more stuff than just, you know, just the, the classic. And that would, of course, be about sex. We're going to talk about that somebody. It would be far wider than that. We talked, we talked uh, a couple weeks ago about envy. The thing about envy is, man, it, it, can, it, it chases you down, but it's kind, of like, it's kind of like the emotion of envy can be kind of silent. Still deadly, but kind of silent, you know, but lust, different thing altogether. Lust is like something that's chasing you loud. Something that's chasing you that you can't get away from. You thought you were chasing it, but it's chasing you. And lust is that emotion or that experience that really, um, you know, it's fascinating when we have conversations about, you know, we have conversations with people, um, family members and stuff about addiction. And in a lot of cases, family members, when we're talking about alcohol and drugs, a lot of family members really believe that they are far, far away from the experience of compulsion or addiction, and they are highly focused on, on the other, on the patient, on the identified patient in the family system. And the identified patient, you know, the screw up in the room, right, is always, always gonna be the addict or the alcoholic. And so you're gonna to talk to a family member and you say, did you know, or what I'll, what I'll do is this, I'll be like, well, what gives you a, let me ask you a question, what gives you a rush? And they'll tell me whatever their favorite thing is, you know, it might be really good food, or it might be some, some kind of sport, you know, or it might be, never heard of that myself, but it might be something like that. And, and, and it, you know, it could be a variety of things, and I'll say, do you know that that rush that you get, do you know that that is the exact same rush that the alcoholic or the addict in, their, in, in your life gets? Well, I know, but I'll, like, I, I mean, I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I mean, I'm really not that. It's like, no, we really are that, though. Because the same pleasure center that hits the brain of an addict and alcoholic hits the brain of somebody that's having a, a sensory or an experience that is a loud rush that is really lustful where I can't get enough of it, I can't turn it off, I can't stop thinking about it, I gotta be a part of it, I gotta have it, I gotta be around it because of what I just gotta, and I, I really can't explain it to you, and I've tried a million times to stop, but I don't know what it is, I mean, I just, I can't. It's the exact same pleasure center. And that's what puts us all in this conversation. You know, this conversation isn't limited to the use of online pornography or print pornography or whatever. It's not limited, but it includes that. It's not limited to a conversation about someone that's sleeping with somebody that they're not married to, but it includes that and creates that same kind of that same kind of experience. You know, someone's, someone's gonna come to me in the next few weeks and they're gonna wanna sit down and they're gonna wanna talk. 
and they're gonna wanna tell me about how, man, it was like going okay marriage-wise, and they've been married seven or eight years, but then all of a sudden at work, I mean, they met this woman at work, and well, I mean, they just kept wanting to be with her, and they just, man, the more they talked to her, the more she understood them, and, or the more he understood her, and then the more, the more he was around her, the more amazed she was, and she really decided that, that, you know, they were soulmates, and that's what you do when you're in the middle of the driver of lust, is you make up any scenario, any solution, any story, any anything, Thing that'll explain this uncontrollable feeling and try and make it controllable. Because nobody likes to be out of control, right? No one likes feeling like they're out of control. What scares most people that are in active addiction with alcohol and drugs isn't the lead up to all the days when it was all okay. It was that one day when it wasn't. And all kinds of stuff broke loose and you're like, man, I am out of control. The danger of lust is that it never, it never by itself, you know, it goes away. It's a, it is an idolatry that silences everything else in life. Reason, history, loyalty, relationship, rationale, the other person in my life, if it's involving sex, you know, my kids, everybody around me, my friends, people at work, it just silences all of that. All the other factors that go into life, all sense of balance goes out the window and lust just says, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're gonna do this. It's that idolatry of passion. It's an idolatry of self-focused passion that says, I gotta because I need this and, and I know that I gotta have this for me, for me. Even if I point in the middle of that rush that you're experiencing, if I point out to you, if I stopped and said, hey, while you're, if I, if I walked into an experience with you and I said, you know, I walk in, you're, you know, you're sitting there and you're with somebody else who you're not married to. And like, I walk into the room and I kind of go, hey, I'd like to talk to you about all what's going on here. Do you realize what's happening here? You'd be like in the middle of the lust rush, in the middle of the, of the obsession with the personal passion solution, which gives you such a good feeling until it blows you up, you would be pretty much oblivious to me. I would not be able to convince you of anything. I would not be able to give you another point of view because in the middle of lust, there is no other point of view. Am I right? There is no other point of view. You know, I talk to people and they're like, man, I've talked to my, my brother about his drinking. And I'm like, I sit him down, I talk to him. You gotta think about your kids, man. You gotta think about your job. You're gonna lose your job. You gotta think about, and you gotta think about, and my brother looks at me like he's not even hearing me. I'm like, he's not. He's not. He's only hearing the lust. He's only hearing and paying attention to what is overpowering him. And right now, he thinks he's okay. Right now, she thinks she's okay. Because we are so convinced that our passion is worthy of everything. And we're gonna to speak to that, that deal of, is that true? And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempting anybody to do wrong, and he never tempts anybody else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to broken actions. And when brokenness is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death, James 1. You know, James 1 is saying, what it's saying is, is that we're not aware when we're in the middle of that kind of a passion push, none of us are aware that we're also in our souls dying. We just think we're trying to accommodate the next hard thing in our life 
And all we know right now is whatever I'm using or doing or thinking or feeling or whatever, it's making me feel better right now. And it's, I love the rush of being taken up by surprise and being in this avalanche, of being in this avalanche of love, being in this avalanche of attraction, being in this avalanche of emotion, being in this avalanche of, man, this is so much fun. You know, I, I know this, I don't even wanna think about what it all means, it's just so much fun. It just feels so good. And all I know is how good it feels. And I need it and I want it and I gotta have it and this is where I'm supposed to be and this is, I mean, passion takes a lot of forms and this is what I'm supposed to do and this is how I'm supposed to do it and this is my destiny and she's my soulmate. It's like, probably not. I mean, if you, if you start off with this deal, probably not. He's my soulmate. Probably not. Look under the surface of the intensity with a flashlight and see what's there, right? Because they're there, you're there, I'm there. You know, he, you know what? He's just perfect. He's, he's everything my husband is not. It's like, right, because he's not your freaking husband. <laughs> If he were your husband, you'd see what a jerk he is. She's everything my wife is not. Right, because she's not your wife. She doesn't know jack about you. If you, I mean, one of the things that I think would end people that have sex with people that they're not married to, that would knock the lust thing right out of whack right away, this would be a great experience. You know what? It would be so cool if, if somehow God, he won't do this, but I mean, if some, it'd still be cool. If God would tip off the spouse of the person who's sleeping with somebody else and they just sort of showed up and they didn't show up like with the, the proverbial gun and all that stuff. They just showed up in the room while those two people were together say, hey, you know what? Before you get very far into this relationship with him, let me just give you the real backstory on him. <laughs> let me just give you the real backstory on her. It would take the lust right freaking out of it, amen? Because you got some balance now. You got some truth now. When I believe something is my destiny and I gotta have it and I gotta do it and it's gotta be that way, gotta just tell you, it's probably not God in the game with you. When God is in the game with you, it's almost always stuff you don't wanna do, the non-attractive choice, the tougher road to go, and the thing that you're saying no to the quickest. Am I right? It's usually the stuff I'm saying no to the quickest. And I'm trying to, out of my passion, I'm trying to offer up God all these other cool ideas. And every time, God's very clear, go on with your bad self, run the table. And I realize now, you know, like I've had that happen enough 10 billion times, I realize it's kind of like, I'm like the big bass on the end of the line of a hook. And the hook, I don't even know the hook is in me because all that passion, right? All that stuff that I just can't feel it because it feels so good. And there's God with the hook. You know, it's just like, run out there. Shh, shoo, woo. And I, I'll tell you something, lust won't pull that hook like that and set that hook to reel you in? Most cases, until it's too late. Until you've wrecked yourself and wrecked other people and wrecked opportunities and wrecked health and wrecked any kind of clarity and any kind of balance about how to live life. It'll run you out until you're almost dead, or you are. What lust does in our lives, it's so magical, you know, but what it actually does to us is it succeeds in sucking the balance out of, it, out of us. Out of the 12 of 12, it says this. It is nowhere evident that our creator expects us to eliminate, now get this, to eliminate our natural drives. Most of us are born with natural desires. When they drive us blindly, 
Does this sound like lust? Or we willfully demand that they supply us with more satisfaction or pleasures than are possible or do us. That is a point we depart from the degree of perfection that God wishes for us here on earth. In other words, when we expect more of a passion, we expect more of a rush than it can really give us, that's when we are being overpowered by something that is sucking the life out of us. It's like someone, you know, someone was explaining to me once, you know, about, about the big, you know, the, the, the insatiable, ap- insatiable appetite of crack cocaine. And I was like, what is it, man? What is the deal with crack? And he's like, here's what the deal with crack is. That first high is so good you almost just can't stand it. It almost takes you out of your skin. And what you end up doing for the rest of your life, unless somebody breaks in and you start to get some recovery, is you'll chase, you will chase that down all the way till your death. Trying to find it because the next one will never be as good. But see, lust lies to us and convinces us that just one more, just one more, just another day, just another week, just another. Because see, the whole thing is, is we start off believing that we have power over whatever it is we're fascinated by until it has power over us. And the whole thing about it is, man, we love, love, love feeling alive and we love feeling energized and we love being excited and jacked up about stuff and we love it because we don't like just normal very much and this is so, it just makes me feel young again until it kills you. Idolatry is like that. And God's gonna allow us to pursue our idols way out there because we need to in order to finally come to terms with what's going on. Lust and power are strange partners. You know, I, I, can be just, I can be just passionate about passion of whatever. It's such a big word, you know, like, well, that, she just overwhelmed me. It's just this over, I mean, my passion, I followed my passion and my passion this and all that. And it's like, you know what that does? That's just saying I followed me and I want everybody to give me a free pass in the arena of reason and balance and truth and honesty and me being okay with just being me. I want everybody to give me a free pass from all of that and let me go and let me follow my deal. You know, how does the enemy use that? Well, here's how, because you're just gonna, it's like, it's like if you imagine yourself in your lust, if I imagine myself in the things that I lust after, if I imagine myself being a grill, here's the enemy. I don't know if you've ever, I mean, I don't know if any of y'all lack, you know, lack patience with your grill ever. You know, like if you have a charcoal grill, I, I, I mean, I now have a gas one because I decided I would kill myself somewhere along the way if I didn't do it. But you know how it goes. I mean, you stand, there's nothing better. There's nothing better than standing there. And you like, if you're married, if you're the guy, you probably have to wait till your wife goes away to do this and your kids, but there's nothing better then there's that flame, you know, there are those little charcoals. And you, you go in the garage and you bring out the freaking charcoal lighter. And you stand there and you find just the right spot and you squeeze that sucker, right? It's so cool to see it. Except the thing about it is, man, it'll light you up. That's what happens to people every single summer. You know, so-and-so had, uh, you know, Mark Beebe suffered second-degree burns in his backyard. I mean, it's like, well, let's just think about what happened in my backyard. It's highly likely that the grass didn't do it. You know, it's like pretty cool. I never had the turf rise up and burn me. It was probably the grill. How do you think that happened? It was probably a charcoal grill. Well, what do you think I did? I probably lit that sucker up. Right? I mean, it's just... You do it at the campfire, why not try it at home? And the enemy's like, that's right, squeeze it. Squeeze it. 
Come on, keep squeezing that old lust. Keep squeezing that old deal. And keep squeezing it. Because every single step of the way, his job, seek me out, wreck me, wreck my life, wreck my relationships, wreck my future, can completely hold me captive. Completely hold me captive. See, like, that's why this conversation, it is about, it is about sex outside of marriage. It is about pornography, but man, it is really about us, isn't it? It's about us holding that bottle and squeezing that fire because we just love the energy of it all. That's how the enemy uses my intensity against me. You know, the only thing, the only thing we're supposed to crave in this world is God. Amen. That's the way we're actually wired is to crave God and God only. Now, I wanna, I wanna read a scripture to you in, in a minute. This, this is what it says. As long as the, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O oh God, the living God. You know, and this guy, if you were, that comes from Psalm 42. And I'm telling you that because it's so important to go and read that entire psalm. Because this guy who is writing that psalm is going through hell at the exact same time he writes this. Everything else about that psalm below that verse is about suffering, difficulty, challenges, defeat, him feeling abandoned, everything tough. A million miles away from passion. A million miles away from anything about lust. And he goes, you know what, God? I just crave you. I just wanna be with you. I just need to be with you. Because see, like, when we decide that we're gonna put our, our lives into God's hands, when we get serious about our relationship with God, when we actually start to crave God, we're actually gonna start to get healthy. We're actually gonna start to get healthy. We're actually gonna begin to realize that the stuff I was chasing was chasing me. We're gonna realize that the stuff that I thought was so important was actually chasing me. When we, when we, when we crave God, when we trust God enough to follow him anywhere, when we'll listen to whatever he's saying to us and do it, when we'll realize that the reason that he has authority in your life and mine is not fundamental because he's bigger than me or stronger than me or even smarter than me. It's because of the love that he has for me. Yeah. The authority of God is, is up there on a cross. The authority of God is vested in the body of Jesus. The authority of God is vested in the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus. When he stretches Jesus out up on that wood, it says, to the world, take him. Take him and let all the voices in your head stop and let all the, you know, let all the marionette strings that are, are pulling on you right now in your life, let all that stop. You know, let the bondage that you're in right now tonight, let me cut the bonds so you can be free. And that's what his son hanging up there on that cross is all about. Don't leave here tonight. Don't leave here tonight in bondage. You don't have to. Don't leave here tonight being drug around by a power that is, by a power that is, yes, greater than you, but also one that's destroying you. Leave here tonight with a power greater than you who is loving you and setting you free. Ask yourself this question. Is the most important thing in your life tonight loving life into you or sucking life out of you? Is the most important thing in your life loving life into you or sucking life out of you? We're gonna open this altar for our last song. And you know, if you're like, well, man, it's been sucking life out of me, I want you to know that Jesus is here tonight. 
And all you have to do to receive him is just say, you know what, Jesus, I'm, I'm here tonight and I'm figuring out that I need a savior. And I want that savior to be you. And I want you to breathe life into my lungs tonight because I haven't had a deep breath in a long time. Maybe you wanna come up here to this altar and pray for somebody you know who's, who you're watching have the life sucked out of them. You know, maybe you wanna pray for people that you know that are going through that. Maybe you wanna spend some time with a, a corrective. If you're a Christian going, yeah, I've been heading the other way. I've been craving other stuff. I wanna learn how to crave Jesus again. This altar is open. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.